Today's compressors are no longer a simple pump that powers the air conditioning system, but rather a complex piece of technology that is integrated with the engine management system. In this video, we will take a look at electronically controlled variable displacement compressors to better understand how interrelated components affect function and diagnosis. For simplicity, we will refer to the electronically controlled variable displacement compressor as a control valve compressor in this video. They are also commonly referred to as clutchless compressor, variable displacement compressor, and also fall under the category of oil retentive compressors. Compared to a traditional compressor style, controlled valve compressors will not pump if turned by hand. They may also appear to have a 1 to 2 minute delayed start. The addition of electronic components means the ECU has to receive input and translate appropriate settings before the compressor begins pumping. Some systems can have over 20 required inputs prior to compressor activation. Interrelated sensor types and inputs will vary by vehicle design. Today we will take a look at four common designs. All control valve compressors will feature a control solenoid. For simplicity we will refer to this component as simply the solenoid in this video. The solenoid is an electrical component that operates on a pulse width module signal. It activates the internal swash plate and changes the angle of the swash plate as dictated by the ECU. This control valve compressor can also be referred to as a direct drive compressor. The motor is directly attached to the compressor crankshaft, keeping it in motion. The decoupler is essentially a protection feature. If the compressor fails internally, the drive plate will separate from the shaft. It is important to verify that the shaft is turning during diagnosis. This control valve compressor will feature an electromagnetic clutch, which transmits torque mechanically through an electrical switch. For accurate diagnosis, the clutch must be engaged. This control valve compressor will feature an electromagnetic clutch, control solenoid, and a rotation sensor. The rotation sensor activates clutch rotation when signaled by the ECU. The control unit must receive a signal from the rotation sensor before activating the compressor. This control valve compressor will feature an electromagnetic clutch, solenoid, rotation sensor, and a flow sensor. The flow sensor verifies compressor activation by monitoring compressor output pressure and will deactivate if no pressure flow is detected. Control valve compressors can also be categorized as internally controlled or externally controlled. You may see both options when ordering a compressor. An easy way to distinguish these categories is to identify if the vehicle has manual or automatic controls and looking at the way the compressor is installed in the vehicle. Generally, if the vehicle has manual controls, it will feature an internally controlled compressor. Internally controlled compressors rely on the pressure in the crankcase of the compressor. And if the vehicle has climate controls as shown, with wired connections at the rear of the vehicle, it is an externally controlled compressor. Externally controlled compressors will have wires coming out of the rear of the compressor. These wires communicate information from the ECU to properly adjust the angle of the swash plate. Diagnosis and repair for a system with a control valve compressor can be divided into three general areas. A lab scope will allow you to test the solenoid's pulse width module sign using pressure to assess variable output. This chart shows normal high and low pressure readings based on compressor output. Keep in mind that the swash plate and shaft are set to a 2% angle when the AC system is off. You can also use an external electronic control valve scan tool to verify input signal to the solenoid and issue variable commands to the solenoid to check compressor output. The following guide lays out a step-by-step -step process to narrow down the source of failure. This is a general guide, not to be considered extensive. Always refer to the manufacturer's specifications for all components and equipment used. First look at the gauges to verify charge and check if pressure is proportionate to temperature. If not, recover and recharge the system to factory specifications. Once charge and pressure temperature relationship is verified, use a skin tool to check solenoid resistance. 
Ideally, resistance should be 9 to 14 ohms. If resistance readings are over 9000 ohms, the solenoid is defective, and the compressor should be replaced. Once you have verified solenoid function, turn on the AC with fan speed on high, windows closed, and select the recirculation feature. Verify if compressor shaft is rotating. If shaft is not rotating, the issue may be caused by a faulty decoupler, clutch circuit, or rotation sensor. Now you can use a skin tool to verify if the pulse modulated command being sent to the solenoid is 70% or greater. With the skin tool in manual mode, gradually increase the command to 80%. Discharge pressure should rise as suction pressure drops within minutes, the suction line at the firewall should drop to 35 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. If solenoid command reads 50% or less, you can assume the refrigerant system is functional, but not being activated by the ECU. The cause of AC failure is likely an engine management component. If the compressor is unable to produce normal suction and discharge pressures with a 70% or greater command from the solenoid, the compressor should be replaced. You should also monitor the suction line temperature at the firewall. 35 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit indicates a normal refrigerant system. If poor cooling is observed in the cabin, check the vents and actuators for proper function. For more tech tips like these, visit gpdtechtips.com.